The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. And I do say it is another edition of Tim Graham and Friends because it's going to sound a little repetitive. I am the host, Tim Graham, here with my co-host, Jonah Bronstein. But as we were saying last week, beware of all of these fuzzy reports. And I don't mean warm and fuzzy. I mean fuzzy is in not clear uh, regarding Stefan Diggs and why he's upset with the Buffalo Bills. We had three different reports saying three different things on three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Maybe it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I've kind of lost uh, track, but we had a report from the Boston Globe and Ben Volan, my former co-worker at the Palm Beach Post, who says that it has to do with Ken Dorsey and play calling. And then the next day, it was another national report that said it is because they didn't get DeAndre Hopkins and uh, and Stefan Diggs had restructured his contract and was upset about uh, not getting anything afterwards. And then the day after that, it was Robert Griffin III on a podcast saying that it was uh, Josh Allen. And then on the fourth day, Ian Rappaport's on NFL Network and says that all these reports uh, are mostly all untrue <laughs> regarding Stefan Diggs. So look, I know that uh, it is the slow point in the NFL offseason, and thank God there is one because the NFL could really take a break. How about a breather, Roger Goodell, and the rest of the NFL? We don't need to have 365 days of NFL coverage. But whether you're running a website or a television station or a newspaper or whatever it is, you need to come up with content sometimes. And if uh, the Boston Globe is saying it's Ken Dorsey, then it becomes Ken Dorsey for a day. And if the NFL Network is saying this or ESPN is saying that, then that's what it is for that day. And it just seems, again, to reiterate what was said last week, a colossal waste of time to try to figure these things out. Sources that are probably not fully educated on it. And then we have, I'm not going to name names, but if you're an outlet that has a Bills insider on your staff and your usage of him or her involves trotting them out to talk about a report out of Boston or California or France regarding what Stefan Diggs is reportedly up to, then you don't have much of a Bills insider. Um, anyways, Jonah, welcome back as always. There was some actual news this week from the Buffalo Bills, even though mini camp is over. Yesterday, it was Eric Washington being promoted to assistant head coach. And then, of course, today, way bigger than that, dousing the hot seat narrative, which is more bullshit that we talked about last week, that has uh, now been rendered a complete waste of energy. Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean are extended through 2027. So that coaching staff and front office is pretty solid for the next few years. And all the people who think that McDermott's coaching for his job and Bean better nail this draft or else it's time to turn the, the front office over. Uh, to someone else, I, I think we can kill those conversations. Jonah, your take on Buffalo Bills throwing shit at the wall season uh, and then some actual uh, news today regarding uh, McDermott and Bean. Well, two different things. I mean, I think you summed it up pretty well. I mean, I we talked about it last week about how, you know, sports – in and of itself, I mean, I have communication texts with McDermott 
actually, I think I gave the one I have to you, but it's communication textbooks that I've read for college classes about how sports participation itself is an act of communication. Spectator sports to large mass audiences is even more of a communicative act. And then obviously sports media is fundamentally a communication practice. And all of that is put together. And I do think sporting organizations and athletes and coaches and teams are communicators with the fans and the people that consume the product. And when you don't properly or accurately or completely communicate your story, you allow others to communicate your story for you. And whether that is in the form of rumors or they could even be true reports, but they are not necessarily the version of the truth that you want out there, that fills the vacuum. So I don't love all of the different aggregation and, and sometimes it's questionable who has what sources and what to believe, but that's what happens when the officials kind of say there's nothing to see here and don't really, Stefan Diggs has not explained properly or you know fully to the fan base and the NFL media why he's upset and it's left open for all of us to speculate or all of us to uh, latch on to different reports or different theories. On the other hand, so I also agree with you on, you know, it was it was silly for anybody to really speculate about Sean McDermott being on the hot seat. Brandon Bean, I think, even more because I think he's done a tremendous job and the stability that the Bills have had over the past couple of years. I just want to interject for the point of this discussion because I don't want people to think, oh, because well, sometimes these things get doused and retroactively people look back and say, oh, we weren't really saying anything about McDermott being on the hot seat. I mean, who was really saying that? I did a mailbag when the Bills season was over and pretty much every Bills question had to do with McDermott's got to go and being uh, or just wondering, pondering, is it time to move on from Brandon Bean? They haven't gotten it done. Even though Brandon Bean has put together the greatest collection of scouts in Bill's history, probably even including when Bill Polian and John Butler were on the same staff. Because Brandon Bean's group is former general managers, future general managers, player personnel directors, executives left and right who are being interviewed, have been interviewed, have been hired away. Um, it, it's been an embarrassment of scouting acumen and experience within the Bills front office since Brandon Bean got here. Some have left, they've added some, but it's always been incredibly loaded and that people are out there just frustrated with 13 seconds or not reaching the AFC championship game again, let alone the Super Bowl. Anyways, those voices have been loud for months since the Bills uh, season ended. And I was... <laughs> amused to see the text that I got today from the Bills PR staff announcing these extensions through 2027. And what a waste of time it's been to wonder if Sean McDermott was going anywhere because he clearly was not. And Terry Pagula is not, has no appetite for going and looking for any new head coaches, whether it's with his hockey team or his football team. Yeah. No, and I'm reading right here on the athletic. I think this came out today, if not yesterday, the Bills fan survey results. And you see both in kind of that one to 10. Joe Viscali is a survey of the Bills fans. That's right. It was posted today, I think, this morning. Right. Uh, confidence level that, you know, at least the fans that participated in the survey, uh, the scores are lower for McDermott and Bean than they were a year or two and they were two years ago. And there's a, I'm scrolling right to the, the exact point here, but there's a specific question about Sean McDermott being on the hot seat entering next season you know, what would have to happen this season for that to be the case? Uh, the largest response being missing the playoffs without a Josh Allen injury, followed by, you know, losing in the wild card round, which would be a step backwards postseason wise from where they've been these past two years. But this contract extension pretty much takes Sean McDermott off the hot seat for at least, I would say, two seasons. I mean, coaches can get fired with years left on their deal, but very rarely does a coach get fired. Even after, after next after season, extension. after next season, 2024, he'll still have three years left on his contract. Now, Terry Pagula has a lot of money. Uh, he can absorb, obviously, he could eat that money pretty easily. Um, it's an expense. It's a, it's a line on an expense report in a highly profitable business that just generates money 
left and right. And with every every team that is sold, Terry Pagula's portfolio gets fatter. Um, with the Washington Commander's sale, that raises all boats uh, in terms of uh, values of franchises. So yeah, he it, he could easily eat it. But firing a guy with three years left on his contract, so we're looking at probably three years, three years of Sean McDermott, barring something catastrophic, barring a crisis within the front office, uh, an open feud with Josh Allen, um, an arrest, you know, if Sean McDermott drives his car uh, into a Tim Hortons, um, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm being facetious because Sean McDermott, that would be incredibly shocking and out of character. Rex Ryan, his pickup truck, maybe you could see it, but Sean McDermott, probably not. Um, but yeah, I keep derailing your points, Jonah. Well, no, I, right. It, it, it would take a tremendous fall from grace for Sean McDermott to be fired at the end of the season, or I think even following any of the next two seasons. I think Brandon Bean is really far away from the hot seat. I can't imagine anything that would have to go wrong with the roster building or the management of this team to say you need a new general manager because Brandon Bean so far, I mean, he hasn't been perfect in his drafting, but I think it's been the most competent general managing of any Buffalo sports franchise in decades. I mean, I think he's done a tremendous job in both in the results, but even if you look into the nitty gritty, the way he structures contracts and the way he's been able to keep adding to this roster when the cap is tightening and there have been some misses in the draft, but there always are misses in the draft. I think he's drafted pretty well. Um, but th there did. And he's beloved in the building at one bills right, drive right. based on anybody I've ever spoken to. They love him. Now, Sean McDermott, he can wear your ass out because that's his personality. And I do hear there are a lot of people at one bills drive that are just like, man, this guy, cause he's so tightly wound and driven. And sometimes there's friction with people like that. Brandon Bean, total opposite. Brandon Bean is chill and, and loose and cracking jokes and he, people love him. Uh, to your point. Well, I think it's also notable to indicate that Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott weren't hired together, but they were hired in the same off season and the same run up to that 2017 season. They both received contracts. I don't know if it came on the same day in 2020, but they both had their contracts extended previously in 2020 after three years. And now three years later, and maybe it shouldn't have been any surprise to us that they both get renewed contracts. I'm not so sure what the urgency was because they were both signed through 2025, why it needed to be done. And maybe part of that is as a communicative act to kind of tell the fan base that, no, we are very happy with the job these individuals have done. There is no hot seat speculation. And as you can see now, we've put that down on paper and, and it shouldn't be in the fans' minds for at least two, three. Yeah, I think it would take multiple losing seasons to really put that in ownership's mind that a change needs to be made. And also, you know, they came in together, they've been extended together, they work very closely together, they have these ties going back together to Carolina, they seem very much, if not in lockstep, very much in tune with each other and their vision for the team and the roster and, and what they want the Bills to be. I really think that if the time ever comes when one of the individuals has to go, that they both go together. Now, maybe if there's some extreme situation, that could change, but I think if it's just about the football team losing games or things like that, Whenever that may happen, I think it happens at the same time in the same offseason, and the Bills need a new general manager and a new coach and really a new era of leadership. And that could not be till way down the line, and I definitely don't think it's anything in the next two, three seasons. And I think it's incredibly healthy in the National Football League and probably in most sports. Uh, we could probably go back and forth. I know that hockey usually isn't this way, and a lot of sports aren't. Uh, a lot of times in football, it's not this way. But I do think that it's healthy when the head coach and the general manager are equals. And that is the case with Bean and McDermott. And a lot of that, to your point, Jonah, is because they came in together. I'm using that loosely because McDermott did get here a couple of months ahead of, of Bean. But they've really been tied together. Uh, they each report to Terry Pagula. Sean McDermott does not report to Brandon Bean. Uh, there is no power imbalance um, as there had always been with the Bills. There was always a general manager who hired that coach, whether you want to say John Butler hiring. I don't want to miss. I don't want to mix up my guys. Uh, but anyways, um, 
You had Buddy Nix hiring Chan Gailey. You had Doug Whaley hiring Doug Marone. You had then Whaley and Brandon uh, having some power and the Rex Ryan. And then, t- and then it was just, everything was out of balance and nobody owed their job to currently nobody owes their job to the other. I don't think. Uh, whereas there was always this, I hired you, um, you are beholden to me sentiment or in the case of some of these uh, power imbalances, there's a pendulum that swings back and forth to where the owner gets in a trap where they're hiring one guy who then becomes the more powerful than the person who was there before, whether it was the coach or the general manager, because they are the most recently hired. They came in with the freshest ideas. They are the one who's in it. They, and if things get stale, then the one who's been there the longest goes. And then the pendulum swings back. And then you have a coach who comes in and demands um, um, personnel authority, which is fairly common in, in all sports now. If, I, if you want me to take this job, I'm some hotshot coach or a, a veteran that you really want. Uh, I insist that I get final say over the roster. Well, that's not the case with Buffalo. Um, so I think that that is important. And I also just wanted to uh, circle back to Eric Washington. And the reason I felt it important to mention that, even though it seems like a minor promotion, I think that that was a step this week prior to the McDermott and Bean announcement. I don't think it's any master plan, but I think it does further solidify this coaching staff without Leslie Frazier. Um, he is taking that assistant head coaching job that Leslie Frazier had. Um, it's largely symbolic. Um, a coach can ask his assistant coaches to have varying degrees of influence within just being a assistant coach. Um, but it is symbolic. It's a thing that is generally viewed towards helping you in your career development Uh, When you uh, interview for a head coaching job down the road, you can have on your resume or talk about being an assistant head coach and what those responsibilities meant within that organization and why I'm that much more prepared to be a head coach in the National Football League right now. So there's a lot of things like that that go along with it. But I think what it is is saying we are okay. We are okay as a unit. We are in harmony as a defense. Sean is going to call these plays and we're all cool with it. And Eric Washington is filling this void and it helps to take a look at this, again, this false narrative that Sean McDermott was ever on the hot seat because Leslie Frazier left. Uh, They now have somebody filling that role. And I know I'm doing a little word salad here, but I I think that there was some significance in filling that crevice uh, within the coaching staff that now, as of today, Uh, with this announcement that Bean and McDermott are are extended through 2027, that this coaching staff is whole and everything's solid and we are cool with it and better get used to it. Yeah. If I could make one more point on McDermott specifically in his extension, there just does seem to be a bit of a disconnect between what many in the fan base feel and what is coming out of, the Bills organization, the Bills building, and for those of us that cover the team closely, kind of how we perceive it and we see it and we feel it. And in this athletic survey, only 14% uh, check the box to where he's absolutely not on the hot seat no matter what. So that means more than 85% of the respondents to this survey think in some fashion, uh, Sean McDermott has to coach for his job in some way, at some level. 85% of the respondents to that survey, Jonah, woke up this morning uh, surprised. Right, exactly. And and <laughs> right. I was a little surprised, too, only in the sense I didn't see it coming. But we should have seen it coming with the math, the three-year math. It's I think we're seeing more and more in a lot of different sports extensions. If you're not getting fired, you're usually getting extended. And keeping your contract uh, long-term, four or five years down the line, is something you see a lot in pro and college sports these days, unless a coach is kind of trending towards the hot seat. You usually don't get into that last year or two of your contract in a lame duck status without receiving an extension unless you're on the way out the door. But, and I'd have to go back and look, but four years of this, an extension of this length seems like an exclamation point. It's not just, all right, we're going to extend you for another year or two and we'll see which kind of keeps you on uh, the coach 
on his toes, like, all right, this is a, a meritocracy here. This is a performance-based business. We'll keep extending you as long as you win. But 2027 is significant. Yeah. Although I don't think it necessarily means that they're locked in through 2027, which is the other kind of rhetoric you get from contract extensions with players and coaches. So-and-so is not going anywhere until this contract expires, but that's not necessarily how things always play out. But with the disconnect in terms of, you know, there's also some national speculation that I've seen or analysis uh, that things are a bit in disarray in Buffalo, that the way the Stefan Diggs situation played out, some of the statements Sean McDermott made, press conferences that didn't go over very well or, or how people perceive them to be, um, that the Bills aren't the darlings of the NFL like they were last offseason and that some people are extrapolating from that, you know, where things are going to go, where they are uh, trending about the Bills, you know, that they're not trending towards being Super Bowl champions anymore and maybe they're trending towards something different along with, you know, the results of these athletic survey, I do think it might benefit Bill's management, Bill's ownership to investigate that a little bit, to understand why some of the outside perception is that things aren't going perfectly at one Bill's drive and, and maybe why that's a difference. And I don't, I don't have any problem with these contract extensions. I think they've both been earned, specifically Brandon Bean, but also Sean McDermott's done an excellent job in terms of his record and keeping this team competitive and some of the challenges they face off the field last year, but it might have made more sense from a fan perception communication standpoint to wait on these extensions, to kind of put something out there to see how this team performs to maybe in well, the, in the well, eyes of perception to earn the, the contract extension with a Super Bowl appearance or a, a season that satisfies the fans desires a little bit more than the past two seasons have. Yes. And no, I mean, yes, there's merit to that, but I'd, I'd be remiss to not, I've been remiss, I guess, for not even mentioning this yet, but the announcement today also cools off some of the Stefan Diggs talk too, because it, let's face it, as people are guessing what's wrong with Stefan Diggs and the Bills, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean have taken some blame. Why hasn't this been settled sooner? Why did it take so long for this to uh, be corrected? Um, why, why didn't you guys uh, have a kumbaya moment uh, back in April or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so I think that this is the organization. This is Terry Pagula saying we're good here. And I love what these guys have been doing and it's all, it, we're fine. And you can, you can peck at us from the outside and you can wonder about this and that, but within one bill's drive, we love it. And we're, we want more of it and we're signing up for the next five years for more. And so I think that there's some, some, some significance regarding, I'm not saying that it was calculated uh, in that regard, but it goes a long way in, in shutting down some of those talks. And by extension, I think it helps um, Ken Dorsey uh, because Ken Dorsey is, Sean McDermott's guy, at least to this point, and they've lost Brian Dable and a bunch of other assistants over the last couple of years. And um, whatever you'd want to say about how Sean McDermott has handled his staff with his losses and replacing important people, um, the Bills are okay with it, clearly. And um, there you have it. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, because I think it it falls in line with uh, what we talked about last week and, and how I uh, started uh, today's podcast regarding Matt Ariza and a lot of people with their armchair quarterbacking and uh, their legal analysis and things like that. I, I, um, I thought that HBO Real Sports segment Tuesday night on Matt Ariza was very well done by Andrea Kramer, um, really looking into the reporting aspects, or I'm sorry, the legal aspects uh, of the case. It was compelling. Um, Matt Ariza came off as a mostly sympathetic figure. And I think it's justified, uh, but it's, but the thing that really uh, struck me after the fact was the crosstalk segment as they, as they call it on uh, HBO real sports, where Bryant Gumbel talks with the reporter and they sit in chairs in the studio. And his first question to Andrea Kramer was, 
what would uh, something along the lines of what blame do the bills have for being hasty and cutting him whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty and while i understand the concept uh and it is a uh you know it's it is a it is a it is foundational to american democracy i get it uh innocent until proven guilty but can you imagine had the bills decided to wait and see if Matt Ariza had really gang raped a girl, uh, a 17 year old girl, and they're going through the season trying to win a Super Bowl, and Matt Ariza is in that locker room with a bunch of guys who are wondering themselves, uh, with a coaching staff that is wondering. Uh, so the idea of innocent until proven guilty doesn't work in in business all the time, uh, and. The pills absolutely were justified in cutting this guy days before the season were to begin. What were they supposed to do? Um, I just thought that it well, was a, an interesting. I, I guess that they could have been helped out if uh, Roger Goodell had put uh, Matt Arise on the commissioner's exempt list and you could have tucked him away. Uh, but I mean, come on. Uh, Arise's attorney was going on television in San Diego saying that the bills knew all about it. The bills were incensed at that interview demanded a retraction uh the retraction wasn't handled very well by the attorney uh Carrie Armstrong um anyway the bill I mean the bills shit I mean what what were they supposed to do well I wanted to make a point you kind of made it very quickly but All right. I, I think it's a fair question for Brian Gumbel to have asked that especially as they set up to get Andrea Kramer, if say you were the reporter on it to kind of respond in the way that you just did, the reasons why it didn't play out that way. But that's such an ingrained part of our culture. And it is something that, you know, the average person will quickly say or ask, what about innocent until proven go guilty? So I think it is important to maybe distinguish why that didn't apply in this situation, because it wasn't a, you know, the bills weren't deciding whether Matt Areza committed a crime and is going to jail, they were deciding how to manage their roster and manage their what turned into a public relations nightmare. And as you mentioned, the commissioner exempt list kind of exists for situations like that, where let's let the legal process play out. This player is off of the roster while uh, the case is pending, and then the decision gets made after that comes about. And I think if and a, a private company can sort of do the same thing. Hey, you're getting suspended but not fired until we learn more about the situation, more about the case. And I do think if the Bills did have an option like that at their disposal, it might have been fair to kind of decide that and say, hey, we're going to give you a year off to deal with this legal matter. And if you happen to be found innocent or not charged a year later, we can uh, reconsider bringing you back. And I think it was one of the first points she made before we got into the details of the case. But when we had Florina Altschiller on the podcast, um, about a year ago, whenever this happened back in August of 2022, I think the first point she made was the, the employee, the, the employment aspect of the, of this. And the bills are absolutely justified under the collective bargaining agreement and the contract of, we don't have to employ you. You, you don't have a right to this job as our punter or as our quarterback or as our backup uh, defensive tackle. I mean, you we can cut you pretty much for any reason we want. It's an at-will type situation, and it was more hassle than it was worth. And that's unfortunate for Matt Ariza. And that goes down to, I guess, bad luck, bad break. Um, there's not a remedy for every misfortune that happens in the world. And uh, there are people trying to get into arguments with me about Twitter. Well, what does he do next? What what is what is what now? Like, where does he get his justice? Well, unfortunately, he gets his justice by going on media and talking to real sports and getting his message out there as much as he can and hopefully convincing a team that he's worth the trouble. But in the process, he has admitted to having sex on the side of a house with a 17 year old girl that he had met 20 minutes earlier. And look, if you're going to decide to take that risk, uh, I'm sure that he knew at that time, whether out his, whether, I don't know how much alcohol he had in his system or how much she had in hers. She claimed to have been drunk. Her friend says not, I mean, that's neither here nor there, but reason at that point as a 21 or 22 year old or whatever he was at that time about to become an NFL player, 
he had to know that this is not what this is not good. Like this isn't what you're supposed to be doing as a grown up, uh, as a mature adult, as a somebody who's who's um, whose future employment is based on you know, uh, your reputation and your personality and a lot of things go into it, whether you broke the law or not, uh, doesn't always apply. It's just how you look. And people would be like, you know, that's a guy who has shown really bad judgment and I don't want him in my locker room, whether he committed a crime or not. Um, and you could say, well, there's other guys who've done worse and the Philadelphia Eagles offensive lineman who is on trial for, uh, committing a, a rape and there's all kinds of, yes, people have done worse. Um, I used the word meritocracy earlier. Unfortunately, a, a late round draft picked punter, a, a rookie um, is expendable when you're trying to win a Super Bowl. And there are some people who are worth the trouble more than others. And all that needs to be weighed when you're making decisions about what you're going to do uh, in whether it's uh, with your life, with a long range plan or in the heat of the moment. And um, he obviously made a really bad decision that night that is costing him. Whether he broke the law or not, the San Diego County District Attorney doesn't seem to think that he would be found guilty if they were to bring him to trial. Um, that's, that's not entirely the point. So Anyways, I thought it was very well done by Real Sports, although Bryant Gumbel was, uh, had some eye-rolling questions at the end regarding the Bills. Um, Buffalo Sabres, Jonah, um, I believe you were out at the news conferences uh, or uh, the availability with Don Granato and Kevin Adams earlier this week to talk about the draft, which takes place next Wednesday and Thursday. And then, of course, NHL free agency begins next Saturday, July 1st. Uh, what were your takeaways? Uh, from uh, the news conference. Yeah, we got to hear from Kevin Adams, and he was joined by Jerry Fortin, Director of Amateur Scouting. Oh, Jerry Fortin. I said Don yeah, Granato, yeah. right? Right, and we haven't heard from Don Granato in a few weeks. Not not that that's anything abnormal, but this right. draft, free agency season, you tend to hear more from the general manager. Um, you know, the big takeaway, this, the draft is coming up. The Sabres have the 13th pick in the first round, which is Wednesday night. The rest of the draft will be on Thursday. It's the first time in 10 years that the Sabres aren't picking in the top 10 of the draft, which kind of signals a bit of a new era in this franchise and where it's going uh, as a competitive team and also no longer a team that's rebuilding and picking the very best prospects in the draft as they have seemed to do so many times over the past decade. But it's also, you know, the, the NHL draft obviously is different than the NFL draft, but it's much different than NFL and even NBA in a way that, you can't look at the holes on the roster with the Sabres need to be a playoff contender next year and then apply that to the draft and think that, oh, the Sabres need a top four defenseman, so I think they're going to take a top four defenseman in the first round, or the Sabres need goaltending help, so I think they're going to take a goaltender in one of the high rounds. That's not how it works with the NHL draft, and Kevin Adams kind of affirmed that, that whether it's positions or style of play or the type of league they're drafting from, that they're going to pick the player that they think is going to develop into the best player four years down the line and not the player that's going to help right. fill a need. Yeah. Right NHL over. general managers often, I'm not saying that that's going to be the case with the Buffalo Sabres and Kevin Adams, but NHL general managers often aren't even around by the time their draft picks uh, develop uh, by the time we find out if they are, uh, were good picks or not. In fact, I saw, you know, Mike Harrington of the Buffalo News had a column this week saying that, uh, all right, here you go, Kevin Adams. This is where his legacy starts now with this draft. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, it, it, it's it, you don't know. So we're saying we're not going to be able to judge Kevin Adams for another four years. Yeah, I would disagree with that or push back on that a little bit, because I think, you know, this I believe this is Kevin Adams fourth draft because he kind of joined in that offseason, that the pandemic offseason. And I think just from hearing Kevin Adams talk and this availability and a few over the past months and end of the season, I think he's very happy with how the draft has gone for them the past few years. And yeah, it helps. They were picking high in every round and they had some extra picks, but Jack Quinn and JJ Paterka, Owen Power was an easy pick, but I think they're happy with the players that they've selected, how those players have developed, whether they stayed in college or, or come through to the minor leagues or in the junior leagues. And I think it gives them a lot of confidence to stick with, what worked in previous drafts coming into this draft or the next draft 
And another, uh, Kevin Adams was asked specifically about this and also kind of in roundabout ways about whether, you know, he's more keen to now trading picks for players or, you know, maybe the Sabres have enough prospects and some people think they have the best prospect pool in the NHL and, and a lot of young players on the roster that maybe it's time to turn some of these draft picks or some of these extra draft picks into players that can help right away. And I didn't get the sense that that's what they're going to do. Kevin Adams stopped short of saying he'd never trade a first round pick, but said, you know, it'd have to be a very enticing offer to consider it. And it just doesn't seem like something he's looking to do. I don't think he's looking to add uh, the really high salary player that would come along with trading your first round pick for an immediate upgrade at, at a certain position. So I think while the draft is important and, and will contribute to Kevin Adams legacy, you know, I don't really think you can point at one draft at this point in time and saying it's make or break. And if the Sabres don't hit on this pick or hit on this, you know, draft class, that things are going to go in the wrong direction, which you might see is three, four down the line years down the line if they were to have had a bad draft here in 2023, by the time, you know, Sean McDermott's contract expires in 2027, you might be able to look back and, and poke holes in something that the Sabres did. But the Sabres have drafted well in the past few drafts, and I think Sabres fans can have some confidence that they're going to continue to do that uh, going forward. What about free agency? Well, free agency opens on July 1st. The Sabres have... Last time I checked on capfriendly.com, maybe about $14 million in cap room. So they have the ability to go shopping and find players to help this team get over the hump and end the playoff drought. I don't know how aggressive they're going to be. They, they definitely do have a need for a top four defenseman, specifically a right shot defenseman that can play alongside Owen Power. And I think that they want to find that player, another Matias Samuelson type, especially if Matias Samuelson gets injured. Uh, they missed him, and having another guy that can fill in on that top line if they need him to is a need, and they don't really have the prospects coming up to fill that spot right away. So I do think you could see a signing like that. But beyond that, I think it's mostly fringe signings, especially at the forward after bringing back Kyle Oposo and bringing back Zemgin Jurgensons and possibly bringing back Tyson Jost. They are really running out of roster spots to add forward to this roster. They have prospects like Matt Savoy, Yuri Kalik, uh, Isaac Rosen, who got a, uh, I'm sorry, Isaac Rusick, who got a two-year contract extension this past week, where he was a restricted free agent and got a new two-year deal. Um, a lot of these guys are on one-year deals or deals that are going to expire, so the Sabres will have more roster spots and more flexibility to maybe add some forwards next year. But I don't really see too many big splash forward signings uh, that could open up a spot if they were to trade Victor Olofsson and he has a $4.5 million salary. So there's some more cap relief coming if they make a move there, but I don't think they're going to add a big time player on the forward lines. I think if they add anybody, it's going to be someone that comes in really in the bottom of the lineup sheet and the focus will be on uh, maybe adding to that defensive corpse. And then I think keeping their powder dry, keeping their cap room uh, set for extensions that they got to reach with, Rasmus Dahlin and Owen Power and eventually Jack Quinn and J.J. Paterka. And then also having this, this $14 million cap room they have right now, I think they might be saving that for an offseason in the future when the time really comes to make a big splash move and put the roster over the top. There seemed to be some surprise, and um, I don't think people are upset about it, but uh, the the re-signing of Zemgis Gergensen is, of course, he'll be on a line with Kyle Oposo almost certainly. And there's leadership there and uh, there's a lot of value that he adds to that locker room. He's been along around for a long time. Uh, but what was your take and, and what was said regarding the uh, Gergensen's um, extension? Well, I'm not surprised that the Sabres were open to bringing him back on a one-year contract. I think my surprise was maybe that Zemgis Gergensen didn't go into free agency seeking a longer term deal from another team if the Sabres were only interested in a one year commitment. Because I think implicit in that one year contract, less so with Kyle Oposo, but I think there's an element of this is that it is a one year agreement and that the Sabres will be moving on at those positions in a year. But I'm not surprised that the Sabres are bringing back Kyle Oposo and Zemgis Gergensen. Don't you, but just real quick on that point, Jonah, though, don't you think that if they play and they're still contributors that those keep getting extended a year, a year, a year? I don't 
think that both of them, and, and you can throw Tyson Joseph into this as well. I think eventually they got to make room for these younger players on the roster. Right. I think that there's some in the fan base that were disappointed to see Gergensen's and, and to a lesser extent Oposo brought back because they think it could block lineup spots for more exciting, higher scoring players. But these guys are all playing on the fourth line. And that's yeah. not necessarily what Matt Savoy or Yuri Kalik going to come in. And yeah, do you're not bringing up these guys to, to have them play you know, 12, 14 minutes a game. Right. And and there's a danger with the Sabres getting, being the youngest team in the league last season and then somehow finding a way to get even younger next season. They're already losing Craig Anderson, who was, you know, the oldest player on the team and a leader. If they didn't bring back Kyle Oposo and Zemgis Gergensen just as personalities and leaders and, and the maturity they bring to the locker room, and they replace them with younger rookies. Then it's I, romper room. Well, yeah, and I think you could see a, a plateau of this team's development if they got too young and too inexperienced next year. And, you know, both of them, they're not big enforcer types, but I think they bring a, a heavier, you know, tougher game than anybody that the Sabres have in their prospect pool or will be drafting. Maybe there's players out there in free agency, but I think if they let – Zemgis Gergensen go, they might be looking into free agency to get another player like Zemgis Gergensen. And, and they're happy. That's what Kevin Adams said. They, they love Zemgis Gergensen as a person and as a personality, what he brings to the team. Uh, they think that he has enough skill to be out there with the system that they play, even if it's in a bit of a fourth line role. And I think Gergensen's and maybe a Poso at some point later this season, or if he comes back for another season, have value on this team as a 13th forward, as a guy who doesn't always play or doesn't get a lot of minutes, but it's on the team and is there setting the example. And when there is an injury, you can put them in the lineup and not worry about, you know, losing too much. And I think that that's kind of the role you're going to see these guys trend towards as these prospects get more and more, you know, needing to play in the lineup later this season or next season. There was some college basketball news this week, Jonah. Um, we learned that St. Bonaventure is going to play Niagara, a matchup that was in mothballs for three years. So that's going to come back. They're going to play at Niagara and uh blue collar. You UB's uh, TBT team ends up with the number one seed after winning the championship last year. Um, What's uh? How about this? Because I don't know the the details of it. Let's let's the the blue collar you and the TBT. What are the? When does that begin? And because that's always a fun summer event. I I like going to Elmo's and watching a little college basketball during the summer when there's really only baseball on. It adds a and obviously UB being um of interest and Elmo's being a bit of a UB bar. There's always a little energy in there. I I get I get into it. Yeah. Blue Collar U as the number one seed in the Syracuse regional, and they don't do specific number one overall seeds like they were for the NCAA tournament, but it was said on the selection show multiple times that if there was a number one overall seed, it would have gone to this Blue Collar U Buffalo alumni team that won the championship last year, the million dollar prize, and uh, should be bringing back most all of the key players that led them to that title. Um, their first game is July 24th against Big Five, a team of you know alumni from the Big Five Philadelphia schools. They'll play, if they advance, three rounds of games at War Memorial Arena in Syracuse, and then the tournament moves on to Philadelphia where the, uh, you know, the semifinals and the championship game will be. Uh, all the games are broadcast in some form by ESPN. The first uh, Blue Collar U game will be on ESPN+, and then as you get further along into the tournament, you're more likely to be on ESPN two or at main ESPN network for the championship game. And, you know, it's even the year before when they went to the uh, semifinals and did not win, I think it's fun for college basketball fans and specifically Buffalo fans to see these players that you got to know over the years playing at UB and going to the NCAA tournament. Now this is year three of this blue collar U they're just becoming uh, more well-known personalities and characters and basketball names and imaging and branding that each time this tournament comes back and each time this blue collar U team comes back, I think it becomes more and more interesting and maybe more fun for basketball fans to follow and see how well they can do. Even if they don't win the full tournament again, just being in the tournament and advancing and being on television. Unfortunately, they won't be playing games in Buffalo, which was something that was, uh, you know, considered. And I have some, maybe some more reporting on that 
next week or so on WIVB.com about why that didn't come about. But that aside, not being able to see it live and, and have this team get its curtain call in Western New York is disappointing. But Syracuse isn't that far away, and they're going to be on ter- television. And if you do want to see uh, C.J. Massenburg, Nick Perkins, and some of these names and, and figures from UB's recent glory days, you'll have that opportunity in Syracuse and on television. Jonah, anything else you want to get to before we wrap things up for Yeah, well, week? you mentioned the, the niagara Canisius game, which might uh, go under the radar for some people, uh, you know, two mid-major teams. Uh, St. Bonaventure Niagara. Niagara. St. Bonaventure Niagara, correct. Um, but you know, this is a historic rivalry that goes back to 1921 and they had not played for the past three seasons. And that was the first time in the history of this rivalry. We're talking Bob Lanier versus Calvin Murphy. Yeah. And we're talking before Bob Lanier and Calvin Murphy were born. These schools were playing each other twice a year and the little three developed that lore with Canisius and they played before this three-year hiatus. They had only not played in four of the previous 100 seasons. And only one time before in the 20s had they gone consecutive seasons without playing each other. And for many, many years, they played twice in the same season. And the fans, especially the older fans, I think, appreciate the Little Three rivalry and appreciate the opportunity to see Bonaventure coming up to whether it's Niagara or Canisius and vice versa. And I think it was unfortunate that the schedules didn't work out and that they did not play each other the last three seasons. And I was a bit worried that that, rivalry and that series was going by the wayside and I think it's good to see that they're back on each other's schedules and St. Bonaventure will be coming up to the Gallagher Center this season and I would assume that means uh, Niagara goes down and plays at Riley Center the following season and any worry about these little three rivalries fading away uh, seems to be put to bed now. Looking at myself uh, on this Zoom call that we use to uh, record the podcast. Uh, I'm reminded uh, that once again, last night, Jonah, uh, and it's probably the third time in the last month and a half, I've had somebody ask me if I dye my hair. And I can see it, obviously, with my beard being white and my hair being dark. Um, the thing is, is that my beard was red, and I think red hair just turns gray faster. But I do look like somebody who dyes his hair, don't I? Am I going to have to start shaving well, the beard? I've known you a while, and we hang out off this podcast, and I've never suspected that you dye your hair because, I mean, your hair is always the same color, and you never kind of see gray roots coming in. So I don't think you I dye mean, I do hair. have gray. I do have gray. That's what I think if you see it close up, you do, if you were to yeah. say, hey, do you dye your hair? I would say, well, then I missed a bunch. <clears throat> but. I just think it's interesting how often you get accused of dyeing your hair and how many different people are doing this, or is it the same, you know, troll bully that just keeps jumping in your DMs and accusing you of no, it's so it's, it's face to face. It's you I was at a graduation party uh for my niece last month, and so I come rolling in and there's some family members I haven't seen in a while. And the first question I got wasn't, Hey man, how you been? It was do you dye your hair? To which my response was, if I'm going to dye my hair, I'd dye my beard. Why would I just do half of it? Well, right. Yeah. Why would why wouldn't you do that? Plus, as far as I would believe from knowing you, if you did dye your hair, I don't think you would lie about it and deny it. I think you might, no. you know, cop to it if that were the case. But you've been accused of wearing toupees and hair pieces toupee. as well. <laughs> yeah. No, nobody toupee believes also. your hair is real. Yeah. I was blessed with my mother's hair. My mother has a helmet. Uh, she has a thick head of hair. My dad had a receding hairline. My brother ended up with my dad's hair and I got my mom's. I'm actually being quite blessed. Um, I, I never get accused. I'm, I don't know why everybody seems to be quite certain this is my real hair and my real hair color. However, however, nobody has ever, and I, it's happened multiple, multiple times when we're together, nobody has ever asked to run their hand, their hands through my hair. And you have had people, yeah. strangers. Well, nobody women. wants to get dye on their hands. It's women. But they always say, can I touch your hair? Yeah. It's always older women, though. It's never been anybody well, like my age or younger. I did get, somebody told me this past week that I have the skin of a 30-year-old boy. They don't know what that means. I don't know whether that was a compliment or not. <laughs> but that's what it was said. Well, it's not only confusing, but creepy. Yeah. Is it a man or a woman that said it? It was a woman, but maybe about well, a 40-year-old woman. I think she that's meant a it little as better. a 
compliment, but it was a you know weird choice of words. <laughs> well, uh, th I'm glad we had this talk because I do feel a little bit better. Um, yeah, I, I've like, what am I supposed to do? I'm so I think like, am I supposed to get rid of the beard? Uh, I, I will admit uh, yeah. you're right. I would admit, first off, I'm not a person that would ever, if I were ever losing my hair, I would never have a hair piece. Like I just, whatever happens to me is going to happen to me. I don't want to do anything other than maybe using a different kind of soap or something. Um, I'm never going, if I had dandruff, obviously I would want to do something with that, but uh, whatever happens up there is going to happen. I've always believed that color wise, um, thickness wise, all that shit. I think in but some I, ways it's a roundabout compliment. You know, yeah, people are saying so, your hair is too good to be true. So yeah, I, I oh I do take it as a compliment. Um, I did dye my sideburns once. The guy who cuts my hair talked me into it because he said that when I'm on TV. And if you're watching on the podcast, I'm showing where my sideburns would go when I don't have, um, it goes down to about my earlobe um, when I don't have my beard. And he said, when I see you on TV, it looks, you can't tell that you have sideburns at all because they blend in with the cut because I'm pale. So my white hair blends in with my white face and it looks like I don't have sideburns. So he's like, why don't we color your sideburns? So I'm like, all right, I'll try that. You know, it was just like a, a thing. It lasts like a week at all, but I'll never do it again. The reason being is because once that's colored, you have to shave every day because it's obvious that you have a, you have colored that sideburn because you're the rest of your beard grows in gray. The beard yeah, isn't colored. So the whiskers come in gray and I had, to, and I hate shaving. So if, if I'm going to dye anything, then that means I have to shave every freaking day. I'm not going to do that. It so, only, it only exacerbates the kind of difference between your beard and your hair. But I'll tell you this, I think sideburns are not really in fashion right now. Anyways, you don't see people with long sideburns and even, even regular sideburns. I think the, the popular haircut, a lot of people are getting. You know, you use Josh Allen as an example is that yeah. kind of skin fade where you shave off the sideburns and not even you don't even see any. Right. Well, I do it. I do it for I have big ears. My ears are so big and they stick out that the sideburn I have always thought, you know, just kind of blends in, bl blends those mud flaps in a little bit. But anyway, I guess my takeaway is that if I'm ever going to dye my hair, which I, I won't but I would have to dye my beard too. And I'm not going to, obviously I'm, why would I just do half of it? That's my response. But yeah, I get, uh, and when I push back on it, I get like a snotty look, like, of course you, like you're lying. You're, of course you dye your hair. I'm like, well, then why the fuck do you ask me? If you're just going to assume I am. Anyway, I wish it was, I was accused of having a toupee because then I just say yank on it. Find out can't yeah. do that with hair color anyways i wanted to wrap up this podcast 10 minutes ago now here we are <laughs> um jonah maybe i'll see you for drinks later maybe you will maybe you won't maybe another day maybe today we'll see thanks to everybody out there for uh watching and listening to tim graham and friends i, I made this uh request last week and i had people actually subscribe please subscribe and then thank you for doing that please subscribe uh, give us a rating on whatever platform it is, whether it's stars or bars or, you know, uh, whatever the rating, a thumb up, a thumb down, a comment. Uh, I, we appreciate your patronage. Um, thanks to uh, CTBK, uh, CPAs and business consultants for our sponsorship and catch you next week on Tim Graham and Friends. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400, 716-630-2400.
to learn how CTBK's one team approach can work for you. We'll